What is going on, everybody? It is Mark Cardula, lead faculty and CEO here at Modern Pain Care, where we make you the complete clinician. Coming at you this week with another episode of the Modern Pain Podcast. And this week, we are going to be talking about something that was spurred on from our last uh, live stream on Instagram, I believe it was. Jared's the uh, Instagram expert in the group, in the Modern Pain Care group, that is. And they had asked, well, how do you deal with folks that in clinic that are very different from you in practice and maybe beliefs around what they do? We, we get this question regularly from clinicians. I got somebody in clinic who's like practicing like, you know, 1975 circa or really doing some traditional things that science may be calling into question. Can pose for a challenging situation for the, uh, you know, for both parties involved. And I think there's ways that Jared and I will probably share that we're probably the best ways of going about it. I know for me, definitely, uh, I'll share some stories. And um, and then how can you navigate those situations and make it be beneficial for both parties involved and not uh, create any challenging relationships that, you know, compromise the, you know, your relationships with each other. And then obviously the performance of the clinic as a whole. But before we do that, let's uh, find out how Jared's doing. How are you doing, there, Jared? Man, I'm doing good. Uh, <laughs> this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I've navigated that situation uh, before and I've helped a lot of other people navigate that situation um, and help them learn from my mistakes. So I'm excited to talk about that. In other, in other you know, facets of my life, I'm getting pretty excited because it's T minus six days until my wife and I fly out to go visit my brother and our cousins in Germany. Uh, so by the time you're listening to this, I'm probably going to be in Germany and or Prague, kind of taking my first big uh, travel experience since COVID. Um, but they have opened the borders. We're vaccinated. We're ready to go. We've got it all you know, planned out. We've got our, got our N95s for public transportation. And you know, we're ready to go out and get in the world again. Nice. It's always good, good feeling when you're, you're kind of back into it and, uh, you know, you don't, uh, have that kind of feeling of being so locked into not being able to do the things. Cause I know you and your wife are, are big on the travel front. So um, it's good to see you guys back into it. And I know, uh, your wife's probably fired up. Your wife's a planner from what I remember. She, she, she locks yes. things down. She, I, I, which she's like your personal travel agent. So, which is awesome. Cause I've, seen your guys' you know, vacation photos and they're always amazing of all the c- cool things you do. So obviously those wouldn't occur without without somebody quarterbacking that thing. So good for you, man. So let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about uh, these situations because again, I think both you and I uh, have dealt with them uh, and from time to time and it, it can be challenging. So uh, wh- what's been your experience in this? And then maybe what are some things that went well that you may have done well and what maybe looking back would you do differently just because uh, maybe didn't you know reflecting upon reflecting upon it didn't maybe go as as well as you planned or or had the desired effect yeah so what you in these type of scenarios you know and to paint the picture you work in a clinic there's one two three four other clinicians in that clinic um you've been staying up to date on the most most up-to-date research. You've been listening to the Modern Pain Care podcast, the Modern Pain podcast. You, you, you're you you're watching stuff on Trust Me, I'm a Physio. You're plugged into Physio Tutors. You follow some people on Instagram that are putting out some good information. Um, <clears throat> and these people in clinic, they don't act like you. They, they're not up-to-date on that stuff that you think that you're up-to-date on or you feel that you're up-to-date on, you're trying to stay up-to-date on. They're kind of practicing a little bit outdated, Maybe they're not getting their patients off the plinth too much. Maybe they're releasing trigger points. Maybe they're breaking down fascia. Maybe they're scraping away, you know, postural, you know, spiral line dysfunctions and stuff like that. And uh, they're reigniting turned off glutes, et cetera, et cetera. So what you want to do is you want to come in with exuberant confidence and let them know that they're wrong. Just kidding. (laughs) That's exactly what you do not want to do. So in this scenario... Uh, especially let's say that you are a younger clinician and <clears throat> you've come into a role where you're working with more experienced clinicians um, that you feel like maybe aren't as up to date as you would like them to be. First of all, you have to earn people's respect, right? If you have these differing beliefs and you're, you're navigating this situation, um, you can't just come in as the new guy and, and, and try to issue all of these changes, especially if the perception of you in the clinic is the new guy, you know, or the new gal or the new person. So step one in any relationship where you might want to share information that is counter to somebody's beliefs, 
you have to build trust. You have to earn respect. This is no different than what you would do with a patient, right? If you come in guns blazing on a patient and you start telling them everything that they've ever believed isn't accurate and uh, that you have all of this other information that they should know and, and you're going to shoot it all at them, you know, through your fire hose. So they're drinking from a fire hose more often than not. And almost invariably that that situation is not going to go well. Right. If we don't try to build a relationship with somebody first, if we don't try to gain someone's trust first, if we don't try to. Uh, gain someone's respect first, anything that you have to offer after after that or past that is probably going to fall on deaf ears or worse, it's going to catch you know the backfire effect and people are going to come back at you even more aggressively. Uh, so let's start right there because I, I think that we could go for a long time talking about this, but I want to kind of break it down piece by piece, kind of the first step. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, uh, having come in guns a blazing a few, I remember I took a position where I was gonna, and I, the the manager's like, I want you to come in, I want you to start really instilling. He was a a fellow, past fellow, and he's like, I want us to really start up in our clinical practice and you know this clinical reasoning stuff. And uh, I prepared a presentation, and you know, looking back, it was very, you know, it, I could see how it was perceived. It was not intended, but it was definitely perceived like I got the right way. You you guys are doing it currently wrong. And here's how we should be doing it. As the new guy, uh, you know, I had been experienced in different things, but I was still new there, regardless of if I had, you know, five, 10, 15 years of experience. So didn't go well, did not establish great relationships. I ended, I was able to repair most of those relationships because people got to know me and kind of where my heart was and kind of what, you know, I was all about. And uh, I think those things um, got better over time, but it definitely did not help my, my entry into that as far as really having, you know, folks that were, they were very kind. It was just, you could definitely tell that I did, they weren't, didn't care for kind of my approach clinically as far as like, you know, interaction wise and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I just, you got to recognize that we're all in this hopefully. And I, I can't, I've never worked with anybody where I had the least bit of concern that it wasn't, their motivations weren't true as far as wanting to help people, wanting to get people better, trying to do the best they can. It's scary in that gray area. And one of the things we do as humans is we clutch to what we know and we clutch to what what gives us some comfort that it, with this complexity that's spiraling all around us with people coming in with emotions and things changing and con conditions not necessarily always responding the way that the old textbook says we were, we, we grab on to what we know. And a lot of times that's tradition. And that's, you know, the, the way we used to do it is a way to just kind of stick around with with clinical practice. And it's hard. It's destabilizing. I think Jared and I, probably can both talk about how horrible it felt to start doing things way differently, like to, to stop laying people on beds, all treatments and doing things. It's, it's an uncomfortable because it's not what we're used to doing. So you got to be willing to step into that discomfort to, to be able to navigate things. But yeah, I would agree that the guns ablaze and approach is a quick ticket to damaging some relationships with, with the folks you're trying to, you know, establish a team with. So it's, it's not helpful. Um, what what do you think would be step two as far as you know you kind of talked about the first step um what would be the next step you you think to get folks kind of you know to, to to foster a relationship and maybe you know something that can help both parties involved yeah so in my mind step two is i don't want to say the shared decision making process or anything like that but you know in in patient education and working with patients we would you know ask for permission maybe to educate next we've built trust uh we've gained respect maybe next we ask for permission to provide some new information and in my mind if you're if you're in the clinic and you're trying to show your colleagues maybe a new way to think i envision that uh there's like a there's a picture that shows you know a good leader versus a bad leader and the bad leader has like a you know a whole bunch of people in front of him and he's standing behind them up on the up on like the cart and he's like yelling out orders or he has like a whip or something like that. It gives a really intense visual of, you know, a leader pushing people to go do what he wants. And then it uh, contrasts that against um, the crowd of people and the leader is out front and he's kind of pointing the direction and he's pulling the people with him. And um, this is, this is something I think similar. Similarly, I, I don't think that you are out front and you're leading and you're showing the people where to go. But what you actually do in this scenario, rather than being out front and saying, hey, this is what you should do. You actually phase back into that pack of people 
And instead of turning back and facing them, you turn and face out with them and say, hey, look at this information over here. Let's go. Over, let's walk over to this information and maybe we can take a look at it. Let's walk over to this idea and let's take a look at it together. I, I, I'm calling in your expertise, my, my, my pack, my clinic, my, my team um, to help me evaluate this. Like I came across some stuff and it was really interesting to me and it stood out to me. And I was unsure how I felt about it. It made some sense. But I want to hear what you guys have to think about it, and maybe we can talk about it together. So what you're doing is saying, I don't know everything. I'm here with you guys. There's other stuff out there to know, and I kind of stumbled across it or I came across it, and I would like to join in some shared discussion and decision-making with you guys to see what you think about this stuff. Um, and maybe you can offer some, uh, you know, some really good questions that might guide that discussion, or maybe you could offer some really good reflective thoughts that might cause that person to, to stop and think for a second. Because what I can tell you is if you're the person that runs up and shoves that information in somebody's face and say, Hey, look at this, this is, this is new. This is, this is evidence-based. This is what we need to do. I'm telling you that this is what we need to do. That isn't, that's probably not going to work well. But if you say, Hey, you know, I was reading this article the other day from this, this really, really smart researcher that's put out some good stuff and you know, I got it through my mentor group or I got it through, you know, some people that I really trust. And it, it said some interesting things about, you know, maybe we should do this or that stuff that I learned in school or we learned in school together. It, it's not exactly the way that we were taught. Like, what do you think about this? Let's let's talk about it. Right. So you're you're offering information, you're kind of getting permission maybe to uh, share that information. And you're not, you're not saying I am the source of this information. You're saying there's a third party that is the outside source of this information. And I would like to come together with you to evaluate this information and see what we think about it. What, uh, what are your thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, I like how you've kind of compared it to patient care because it is you're dealing with human. It's a human interaction and you have to be able to, to, to if you're trying to move somebody in your direction, it ain't going to happen like, you know, the, the character of the stick, you know, you know, with the like you said, that leadership example is like, you know, using the stick of this is the way to do it. We should be there and let's just push. But it's that come alongside somebody in their journey and see, you know, and like you said, instead of like, you know, facing back at the person and pulling them towards where you want them to go, you know, link arms with them and start moving towards that information. And, you know, I, I think things like journal clubs and things like that, where again, it's not positioned as I'm going to teach you the right way to do it is like, let's just look at what's currently out there in literature and see if we can all improve what you're doing. We, all of us, you know, not just like, you know, identified where it's some sort of thing to target um, the clinicians who we're feeling aren't maybe practicing up to current standards, but, and then, you nailed it as far as like, you know, let's provide some some reflective questions and some things that are not threatening. I think, you know, you can't get into where we're starting to question the root of somebody's practice or the most comfort, you know, the biggest thing that they're maybe taking comfort in, you know, if that maybe it's, you know, trigger point, you know, focusing in and, and different things that again, where it's more doing things to people versus getting them off tables, which we know probably not the best long term plan of care, which a vast majority, I don't know, between people that are role in that way anyway. But yeah, I think the the coming alongside and and having conversations that are positioned as, you know, hey, I respect what you're doing, you know, and I, I really want to have your expertise in on these conversations that we could have to see what the current literature and what this new idea is. Um, maybe you set out some time, like I said, in clinic to to have those type of journal clubs or or clinical topics or, you know, you know, sharing of, you know, techniques and things like that. Um yeah, I think I think there's that's that can be a valuable valuable way for folks to kind of navigate things forward with with somebody, um, because you're not going to get pulled into a different way. I mean, you can just check out social media and, and think of some people that might have different views you on social media and and uh, how that kind of sits with you and how you know you, you know your visceral reactions are. So you know, and of course, social media is that you know dichotomy of it's this way or no way, and you know that doesn't always sit well with me either. But I've had to recognize the medium of communication and the limitations it poses. And um, so I, I just think we need to be smart with how we communicate and, and, and recognize there's usually a middle ground that we can strike with a lot of, a lot of different things. So any other, what's, what's next step you think there, my friend? I've got, I think I've got two more steps. Gotcha. Um, next step, step three is recognize that 
belief and behavior change is a very, very slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the beliefs that you have, you didn't just like, boom, all of a sudden come to them. That was a really long process. You don't even, you probably don't even realize because you have an inflection point where you think that your beliefs changed, but the vast majority of time you've had experiences and been exposed to information and had conversations and had mentors and had a, a, a million scenarios lead up to that one point where the light bulb comes on for you, right? But everybody remembers the light bulb point. They don't remember the year or two years or three years that lead up to the light bulb point. So be patient and start leading by example in clinic. And when I, when I say lead by example in clinic, I mean, don't poo poo on the way somebody else is treating, but try to do your best to have great conversations, to have great patient care in clinic. And when your patients are crushing it and when your cancellation no show rate is next to nothing and when people are singing your praises and when that patient that your colleague said, I don't want to see that person because there's no way they're getting better. They're a, they're a malingerer. Their, their pain is fake. They're embellishing it, whatever, whatever. When you start having success with those difficult cases, people are going to go, wait, 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 wait a second. That, that person's doing something a little bit different. I'm noticing in clinic, they, they have a different vibe and their patients are really crushing it and, and things are going well. Maybe I want to ask them a couple of questions about what they're doing or, hey, I, I heard you say X, Y and Z to a patient. That's not what I learned. Like, why are you saying that? Why are you explaining that thing that way? What is that? What's that research that you quoted? What like are those statistics real? Do do 88 percent of people actually have changes to their disc on an MRI or we like you start having those conversations in really eloquent ways and you start you know, inviting conversation and, and not forcing information, you get good outcomes, people start to take notice, people start to listen. So that's a, that's a six, six month, 12 month, 18 month, 24 month process, right? Uh, so you can't just like flip that switch and have your whole clinic environment change. But what you can do is gradually become the change in the clinic that you want to see. Yeah, no, uh, very good points. I think, um, yeah, the, the process is a process, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, um, you know, move people from their beliefs and behaviors. Uh, it doesn't have a patience often for a while. Like I've had some persistent pain folks who've been dealing with some, you know, difficult situations for periods of decades, if not more than that, to where, um, you to, to think we're going to change that at all within a matter of a nice tidy eight week plan of care. Um, Probably not realistic, and nor was it with with um, some of our clinicians who've been practicing for decades, maybe like this guy and and uh, others. But yeah, I think um, you know, you know, just trying to recognize that it is a process, and and if you consciously take it on that way, and not try to you know invoke change right away, um, I think you know, and, and just kind of you know the just chisel away with 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 steady you know, respectful dialogue. And then also, like you said, let your, your, your actions speak the loudest and let your outcomes speak the loudest as far as, um, you know, what you're doing with patients, what you're, what patients are, you know, singing praises about you and what you're doing and, and taking some of those people that traditionally might be labeled as the difficult patient and, and all these different things. And you're starting to see those people and, and making an impact in their, in their lives and, and moving them in a better direction. I don't think, as a clinician, you know, if you, if your heart's in the right place, you, you can't take notice of that and say, gosh, what's going on there that I, I, I need to, you know, might have some, you know, but, in, and for some clinicians, it might take longer. I remember just for me, example wise, when I was very ingrained in the, you know, minute millimeters assessments of manual therapy. And I thought the keys to clinical practice were just, you know, through amazing Jedi hands. And then I had a, I was practicing with a group, a bunch of people were doing MDT which was sacrilege to, you know, and there was like this underground bitterness and still exists because I still hear it on social media, like, oh, these people are just getting everybody extending and all this stuff. And which, you know, maybe there's people that are doing it that way, but it's, it's a lot, it's a, it's a good thought process. It's, it just, you know, uses good clinical reasoning and it's, it's not really anything to get all uh, huffy about, but you know, some people, you know, are destined to get huffy about things, but, um, 
and it wasn't until I finally said, you know what, I'm seeing some significant changes with these patients that I'm not uh, getting with my own practice. I probably, what do I, what I need to at least invite that and ended up, you know, shadowing and mentor, you know, get mentored by a few clinicians and then eventually took some coursework myself. And I'm not here to toot any particular systems horns. I've done other things, you know, fellowship and different things that I think, you know, for the right person might be a great thing, but just a well-rounded, you know, toolbox, but that's a different conversation, of course. But what's, what's, what's your, your final point as we look to wrap up here, Jared? Okay. Uh, point four, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. It's a little bit of shameless self-promotion, uh, for modern pain care or Greg Lehman or Ben Cormack or Sandy Hilton or Peter O'Sullivan or, you know, Adam, Egan, whatever, right. Uh, whoever's teaching courses. Um, sometimes it is going to be the most effective approach to bring in a third party expert, right? To say, I don't wanna catch this fire. I don't wanna be the one that draws the, the, the uh, target for introducing this information. I am going to bring in a third party expert to come in and present these ideas, navigate those difficult questions, have those tough conversations, offer reflection, and then let them step away and say, hey, like we've been exposed to that information. What do you guys think about that? Like, you know, uh, Ben Ben Cormack made some really good points with that course that he taught. Mark and Jared, like they, they said some stuff about pain and the complexity about pain. And they, ta they talked about clinical decision-making and stuff in a way that, like, that, that wasn't the way that I was taught. Like you bring in somebody else that has third-party expert status and is often perceived in a different manner than you. Because if you're just the guy in clinic, and especially if you're the young person in clinic, like maybe you don't carry that clout. Maybe you don't carry that perceived weight when you speak yet. But if you bring in some third party person, they might have a little bit more perceived weight than you, and they can also take the fire. So then you can go into your team and say, hey, we were all given that information let's talk about that information. And it's not coming from you. It comes from another part, uh, another direction. And you can, you can get together and help people digest that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like it. I think, um, somebody's knocking on my door here in my office and I can't talk. It's my daughter. Probably she's four years old. So, uh, we'll, we'll give her, we'll give her uh, a pass on that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it is shameless self-promotion, but as you mentioned, there's some great people doing it and we've served in that role where we've kind of introduced some topics of, uh, and, and brought some coursework to, and again, we try to do the same thing. It is amazing to me. Like I try to go as feathery light tip tone because we recognize, and I've been there, it's a delicate spot for people to be in, uh, as far as when you're getting some of your cherished beliefs and practice patterns somewhat challenged. And, uh, we try to, you know, position it as we've all been there and we're all on the same team and different things. And it's still, you know, occasion I, we have clinicians who, you know, aren't, you know, I don't want to say not happy, but you know, it, it doesn't rub them the right way that things are getting challenged. And, um, you know, not based on, you know, again, I think we do a very delicate and respectful job of that, but there's just people that it's just too much of it. And I probably was that clinician in, in earlier parts of my career. Um, but yeah, I think, um, having a third party can very be very helpful to to make that happen to 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 not catch the fire and it's there's just something of like when you work with somebody day by day and you see them act like a fool once in a while because i try to not be captain serious and i'm very you know try to you know have nice relax you know relaxing conversations with patients and 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 make things to where um you know it's not always just serious i'm the paternalistic expert all the time with everything i'm very you know you know try to get to know people as people and where they're at from a person perspective and all those things and then um you know navigate things so it's hard to get positioned as it's just you know and that's where i think when people shadow people in the clinic it's helpful um but it, you also see that you know people aren't doing any like jedi amazing things i used to think what what expertise in a clinic was was oh my god these guys are so great with their hands i'd say they're amazing communicators they're amazing ability to to get to know a human and and tap into what's going to get them to to hopefully move towards change but any other uh, parting thoughts that you have before we wrap up today, Jared? No, I just, I just really, if you guys haven't, if you guys haven't picked up on it, I, I, I want 
to make sure that you recognize that it's the same skeleton, it's the same framework as how you interact with your patients, right? Uh, humans are humans. People people have difficulty with belief mm -hmm. and behavior change, yeah. and uh, you have to navigate that situation similar similarly across all aspects of your life, in your relationships with friends, in, in your uh, relationship with your spouse, in your relationship with your patients, with your colleagues. Uh, there are, there are central components that are they're just going to be the same. And if you can recognize that those factors are present in all of your interactions with other people, I think that goes a long way. Yeah, 100 percent, man. I'll, I echo what you said, of course. And uh, my daughter continues to pound on the door of my office. If you're hearing that in the background, real life, baby, this is what happens. You know, I, I try to sneak it in before she gets up and then. I got daddy at the door, but I think we have some good background noise canceling in my podcast software. So you may not hear it, but it's, 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 it's there just so you know, just so you can see the real world behind the scenes, look at the modern pain podcast today, but hopefully you guys enjoyed the episode. But as you can see, these are all stimulated based on where are you guys having struggles and what can we do to help you kind of navigate? Cause usually there's struggles that Jared and I have both in the in, and sometimes continue to deal with. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if there's anything we can do to help you guys in your practice, um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Um, as you know, you can it, kind of get us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, email mark at modernpaincare.com, jared at modernpaincare.com. And we're happy to have some conversations and, and see where you're at and see if there's things we can do to help you navigate the amazingly complex and gray area that is the clinic. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it, like I said, and until next time, we will talk to y'all later.